Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome here, Gallery Max Hetzler. Um, we are very happy to have Toby Siegler here with us from London to talk about his current show here. And what we would like to do is to try to get some insight in the paintings that surround us, the sculptures, the moving image work at the start. Um, Sometimes, looking at um, Toby Ziegler's paintings, I have the feeling that I'm looking actually not at one painting, but maybe at two or multiple paintings that are sort of layered and came together. And um, there seems to be very different attitudes within one painting. There's, you see some clear figurative motives, but you see also this strong, um, mark-making gestures and they seem to come from very different sources and um, still they come from one man who made uh, these paintings. Uh, this is something I would like to, yeah, maybe to look into to ask how Toby sees this kind of thing. Um, before we go there, um, maybe a bit about um, how this show came into being um, and where Toby is from. Toby was born in London, raised in London, went to school in London, went to art school in London and still lives in London. You must like it in London, no? <laughs> Morning. Yes, I suppose I can't escape London. <laughs> you can't escape. Um, but I, I think I'm very much an urban creature and I love the city. I mean, it's a tough place to live in a lot of ways and it's sort of crowded and dirty and there are lots of aggravating things about it which I suppose is why I think it's um, interesting. You went to art school also in London in the 90s. Could you, could you tell us something about the, the, by the time that you went to school, what was kind of the, the artistic climate that you met there or that, uh, I, I imagine it was not very much uh, directed towards painting, no, at that time? No, I think it was, there was, um, I suppose a lot of people were lamenting the death of painting at that time, <laughs> as they seem to do fairly regularly. But I think um, I sort of have always thought that painting is still very useful. Um, although, actually, it, I mean, that school was definitely prompted a kind of crisis for me. Like, it, after leaving, I immediately gave up making work for a couple of years, it took me a little while to kind of find a way to start again. Um, I think I had to really sort of, yeah, reinvent, find a way to make a gesture again, um, which involved kind of creating a structure for myself that I could then kind of retaliate against. Was it, was it clear for you from the start that painting would be your main focus or? I think, no, I've always made paintings and sculptures, and the two really feed each other a lot. Um, I think they both inform each other a lot, but I suppose I've loved painting for a long time. Um. Maybe we could uh, talk about uh, the, um, the... Because in this exhibition that, that we see, there is actually... Um, there are some paintings that are in the background, a sort of mental image, you could say that were very important in the, for you to make these paintings. And these are some works by the, the French painter uh, Georges de Latour, um, one of them called the, the Fortune Teller. Yeah. Um, this is when you come into the exhibition, you, you see these double screens. And um, this has to do with how the motives of these paintings um, came here on the, on the metal, so to say. So maybe you could introduce this in, in the genealogy of, of the paintings we see here and what, what the screens actually mean. Sure. So the, the video work as you first come in, I think it's the product of something I've been researching for quite a few years, but also it's a kind of analogy for something that runs throughout the whole practice, but is very much governs the way I think about painting as well. So the logic of that video piece is um, kind of governed by the logic of uh, the image search on um, Google. When you make a similar image search, 
So rather than putting words into the search term, you put an image in, and then the computer reduces this to a set of parameters or data and tries to find similar images, but it has to translate it into a set of parameters or criteria. And I've been doing these searches for quite a few years and turning them into these little sequences of images. So what you see on those two screens is on the left-hand screen is the image that I fed into the search term. And on the right-hand screen is all of the results that Google gives you back. And sometimes I show it as the grid or sometimes as a sequence of images. And as I slowly modify the image on the left, you see the results on the right change dramatically. And a few years ago, the technology was very simple. It just dealt with tone and color. So when you put this image into Google, it just said, these are the colors and these are the tones. And if we feed that in, the most popular images in descending order are these. So it became like an idea for me just about a color association. And it was interesting <laughs> because you would put in an image. And depending on what was in the news that week, you'd see images associated to, to that. Or it kind of suggests the idea that the internet is like this collective subconscious, and you can see what people around the world are thinking relates to a set of colors. Although obviously that's not true. It's being manipulated constantly by the people who run the company or by the algorithm. And, and as time has passed also, the system has got more and more sophisticated so that now Google can tell the difference between a painted image or a photograph or a piece of graphic design or it can do facial recognition, it can read. Uh, so, so you never put words in the Google search, you put an image? I mean, sometimes it's interesting to try a combination, but um, I suppose for me the thing that's interesting is the idea that it takes an image and then it turns it into pure information, so pure abstraction, and then that gets turned back into an image again. And I think that's where there's an analogy for painting with me, because I've always been interested in the idea that there are certain painters who self-consciously make images that work on, on two levels. They can be totally abstract somehow and totally figurative at the same time. Um, and I think there's a kind of genealogy of painters that I've loved who, who do this, these paintings that sort of fall apart, that somehow there is an image and there is a subject matter, but then it falls apart and there's this other image that exists uh, maybe on top of it or kind of underneath it. And, and in the way the film also suggests that you have this image on the left and then there are all these other images that are hiding behind it. But you did, as I understood it, you just don't put the, the, the image of this painting of, by the Latour, but you also manipulate the image yourself. Absolutely. So you put the, the Latour painting in and you find paintings by de la Tour, but then you turn the painting upside down and you put it in and the computer fails to recognize it. But maybe it will give you other paintings with a similar palette. Somehow it still knows it's a, a painting, but then if you reverse the tone, again, it's another step of remove. Or then if you put a piece of text in the middle of it, so I put a Google logo, there was some sort of idea of cannibalism that I quite liked. What happens if you feed the Google logo back in? That in combination with the Tulator gives you a whole different set of results. And then I started to experiment with introducing other elements, other visual languages. So what happens if you put a face in? Or what happens if you put a particular face in? And there's all sorts of stories um, in the news about the algorithms um, malfunctioning or you know and often they make very controversial decisions where they fail where a human might not or they you know there's also talk about you know an algorithm being racist like it will make all sorts of preconceptions and it could just be bad programming or it could be that actually it's reflecting things that it's noticed humans doing because the whole time the algorithm is actually gathering information Whilst you're using it, it's also learning, because it's an artificial intelligence. 
did, did this search make you look in a different way at the work of Georges de Latour? Definitely, yeah. I think it's interesting. The reason I found... It, Maybe in, you could say something about your initial interest in particularly this painter. What, what is... Yes. Do you like him very much or is... I'm not, I mean, the truth is I don't particularly love de Latour, but it was perfect in a number of ways for me, for the project. Um, I think he's an interesting painter, and I think it's interesting that, that they're so narrative, and there's a sort of geometry to the narrative in his paintings. There's always these relationships between like hands and eyes, and uh, there's this story that's told in a very kind of filmic way with all of these different little vignettes. And when you search it on Google, you get lots of details. Uh, rather than you get the whole image, but you also get all of these little fragments like what does this hand tell you and this hand tell you and this person is making eye contact with that person and um, So in a way there's something perverse about using these highly narrative very structured paintings illustrative paintings to, to try and Be a departure point to make something some paintings that I think of as ultimately abstract. But I think there's also this idea that somehow that geometry might remain even if the, the narrative is gone. And I think I'm always interested in the motifs that I choose to start with, in the idea of objects or images that gain and lose narratives. Um, so, so basically you look at all the paint because you, you didn't for this show, you worked with the Latour, but in previous show, I think you worked with Bruegel or with Matisse or um, with Piero della Francesca, I think. Yeah. So, um, the, um, actually, you look at these this painters, which are often figurative, narrative painters from the past. You look at them in a quite abstract way, or like the play of hands or the, the lines of the eyes. Is that correct? Like, yeah. yeah, I mean, also tonally, there's something very interesting about them. They're always these quite luminous images. Um, but I think for this show, it was specifically these, the geometry of details that appealed to me. And then in a way, as I was working on it, I realized there was another kind of um, analogy for what I was doing with the image search in the fact that this painting was called The Fortune Teller. And I think one of the things I'm interested in is this human desire to find structure and order where actually maybe there is chance or a, a set of seemingly random images. So when I look at Google, I always find poetry. You know, you see a sequence of 30 images and you suddenly start to notice echoes or, or rhymes or, you know, sort of, uh, you can create your own set of associations in the way that a cut up poem might, or the, I think it's something that, it's a very human predisposition and you can find it in so many different, uh, well, there's so many different examples of it, you know, whether it's like the, the I Ching or <clears throat> if you go and see the fortune teller and they tell you 20 things and you say, you s focus on the three things that you feel are true and you find the truth. Someone has predicted the truth. And I think um, there's something also there analogous to looking at abstract painting and, and this idea of unfinished paintings that as the viewer you come to the work and you complete the work and you project onto the work yourself. Actually in the in the in the Latour's painting you see you see somebody who is okay, who wants to know his, his future and asks gives a coin to, to 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 know about the future. And so while he he asks advice of the fortune teller he's being uh, robbed, no? Yes, so. and I suppose actually Google also does this. You know, Google, when it was originally designed, the people that they approached for funding, they were saying, why do we need another search engine? And 
the designers explained this wasn't a search engine, it was an artificial intelligence disguised as a search engine. So the whole reason for designing this software was to, to um, gather information rather than to provide it. So it's actually stealing from you all the time. It's learning. Um, the exhibition is called The Cheat. So this has to do with the same, that somehow there's a cheat going on in this. <laughs> in <the laughs> yeah. Or this is something we have to solve ourselves, why it's called the cheat. I think often the titles are meant to be like a question mark uh, rather than an answer. So if I, if I take it just to a very different end, like, is it not imaginable for you that you go to the museum, you look at the Latour painting, and you go in your studio, and you work from your memory about thinking about that Latour painting, that that, that couldn't be your approach. I think what I'm more interested in is the way that we receive images and the way that images are circulated and the fact that often I, I have never seen the painting in the flesh. It's an image that I've only seen possibly as a very degraded JPEG and a luminous image on a screen. And I suppose I'm interested in, as I already was saying, the kind of loss of information. There's a very real loss of information when a painting is reduced to a you know a JPEG that's only 30 pixels wide. Um, but also this sort of context that's taken away and this other context that's created where it's juxtaposed with an advert for, you know, losing weight. Oh. But, it's, but it, is it something that, that uh, when you started out as a painter, that, that um, it, it was like considerations that how, how, how does a painting function in, in digital times? Definitely. That you started to think about this kind of circulation? Because I, I don't hear like, it's, it's not like a value, it's not like a judgment you make, no? No. It's, it's more like an observation that... Well, or, or even just something that seeps into the work without you consciously deciding to make, I didn't think, oh, this is what I'll address in my work. I think you make work and, and you suddenly realize that the times you live in and the way that the majority of people probably see my work in reproduction on a computer rather than here in the gallery. And it's obviously a very different experience. Doesn't that bother you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I like the fact that the paintings definitely behave differently in the flesh. You know, they're very physical and they're very, they change according to the light and they change according to where you're standing. And there's also this, you know, they change whether you're standing at one end of the room or, or 10 centimeters away. You know, the, there's a lot of stuff that I love about painting that is the sort of magic trick that painting can perform. But if you think of, of exactly this kind of painters that you choose as, as, as models, I would say, mm -hmm. um, I think they were interested in representation of certain scenes. And in your work, I feel that you also have this interest in representing, um, but at the same time, you seem to, to erase also the image or to put obstacles in front of the image um, or put it through a filter like Google to, to change this image. Does it say something about your, yeah, the, the belief you have in, in some, some kind of representation as a painter? Like... I think it's to do with something that um, I, I suppose I've identified in a lot of paintings that I love. Um, which might not be things that you'd necessarily expect, but that you can look at um, a figurative painting and somehow the figuration completely falls away and there's just a strangeness. You know, you might be looking at a still life but at, from the 17th century, but actually it just becomes a form, a very abstract, alienating form. Um, and I think there are 
certain painters who particularly kind of, and I wouldn't say George de la Torre is one of them, uh, but maybe that's why he worked for this, but the painters that I probably keep going back to are the ones where somehow the painting falls apart. It feels like it's on the brink of collapse. Um, and often they're damaged paintings or unfinished paintings or paintings that have a kind of a velocity, like a different a sort of real variety of speeds in the way that they've been made and in the way that you look at them where, yeah, they do feel like the, the figuration sort of disintegrates and that somehow the figuration is also... Um, in combat with this other agenda, which is somehow almost supersedes it, and it is just this purely abstract form that... Yeah, and that, it, is, that, is some, that is actually a good description of what happens here, no? Yeah. Like a combat between two different ways of painting. A combat, but hopefully a kind of synthesis as well. Mm -hmm. You know, it's hard to say which. They're fighting, but they, you, they, you, it's like a, two things that pull. You, you, you perceive it as a kind of a friction or not? Or for you it's kind of... Uh, because it, it seems like first you do this more represent, representative layer, with, with, in this case with figures from this fortune teller scene. Then you start to uh, erase it with like uh, sanding for instance, no? that you, you take off part of the imagery. Yeah. And then in another layers you come with more... Yeah. I think you couldn't have one without the other. For, for me, like, I couldn't, be, I couldn't make the gesture. Like, I feel like, in a way, the painterly gesture that I, I wanted to make has evolved in these paintings. It's become this moment where you start to remove the image with a sander. So I might spend a month making the painting. And initially, they're painted on aluminum panels. So the whole panel starts off silver. And then I paint on top of it with oil paint. So that after like a month, the whole surface is covered in paint. Um, and there's this figurative image. And I've kind of got to believe that it works as an image, that it's successful as an image, to get to the point where I can then start to kind of disrupt it again. So then... What, 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 is, what, what is successful as an image? What, what does that mean? Oh. <laughs> it, it means that we that we believe it, or that that we that we are captured by the painting. Or yeah, I suppose it's quite formal in a way that it works tonally, that it has, uh, it, it works as a composition. But maybe it is, uh, it, even though it's highly figurative, maybe it is still somehow treating it as a as an abstract image as well, to some extent. Like in in a way, the figuration is something that. I feel is divorced from the act of painting it. That's, that exists at the beginning as a kind of springboard. Um, but, but as you describe it, you have this full, maybe quite detailed yes. image on, on, the, on the aluminium, and then you start to attack it, so to say. Yes, and it's terrifying always. It's like, you know, a month's work can disappear in half an hour, and it's sometimes quite easy to go too far and undo everything <coughs> or to, and yeah but so what you have there that 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 couldn't serve as a credible painting uh, yeah exactly i don't think the the first image although i have to get it to a point where i love it in order to sabotage it 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 wouldn't work for me as a painting because i suppose the whole point of making that structure was to make something to kind of uh, retaliate against. Yeah, and can you describe how you go on then? Then, then, it's, then it's actually more layers, but it's layers of partly of taking paint away and then adding paint, in this case in, in red pinkish color. Um, they um, I mean, I think the, the top layer of paint is something that somehow relates to the image that was underneath um, in one way, but then is a complete uh, 
juxtaposition mm. in another. But you, you, you react in, for instance, to the, to the, the, the forms of the figures, or it's like... Yes. What, what's the relation Some. between this, um, between this initial painting, or the initial <laughs> figures that you see, and the marks that you make? How do you, how do you, is it, is that an intuitive thing just to go over it, so to say, or is it more like a compositional um, process that you think like, okay, I see this and this, so I have to counterbalance it or I have to make it invisible or? I don't, I think it's both. I don't think it's, I think it can be intuitive and compositional. Um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out this interest in, in uh, unfinished <laughs> paintings, which somehow is, sounds sort of interesting to me, like, um, because I thought when you said that to me that um, maybe you like so much unfinished images because we are surrounded with so much very detailed realistic images. Um, and if, if as a painter you, 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 you want to make a painting that keeps up in this context. I think it is. I mean, I think some paintings definitely l consciously leave room for the viewer and a very deliberate in the fact that looking at painting is a creative act, that when you come to the painting as a viewer, you're finishing the work, and that you're bringing your associations, and, um, but also that you're joining the dots and you're filling in you know, so much. Um, and I've, I think, it's partly that, it's partly just this transformation that happens in the eye and the brain and, and being conscious of that when you're making the work and, and leaving space. But I think it's also... Um, I don't know, like I think... I think there's something about images being exhausted by familiarity or being exhausted by um, overexposure or um, or by by use somehow. Um. Yeah, this was maybe kind of the context that you described while starting in art school. That there was this mood of okay, what what can a painter do? No. Yeah. How can you make a painting that is um, that we can believe in? Yeah, I think when I left art school, it felt like there was this sort of weight of the history of painting and this cliches about being a painter, and it felt very hard to find a way to make a gesture. But I think, um, and and the way that I found to do it was to sort of create a whole um, a schematic process that then uh, allowed me to have a counterpoint that allowed me to make a gesture. And I think, I think painting's still incredibly useful, actually, precisely because we consume things so fast and we consume images so fast and we're bombarded by them, that I actually think the amount of time that it takes to make this initial image and then the amount of time that it takes to obliterate it, you know, there's these different speeds of making in the painting and I think that paintings this, they give themselves to you slowly, often, and there's something nice about that kind of archaeology that's involved in making the paintings and looking at them, that there are these different layers. <clears throat> the act of making them is a process of really, uh, you know, going, uh, erasing, and then layering on and I think the act of looking as well has these different speeds. And I think that's something that really runs throughout a painting throughout the centuries. Some bits of paintings feel like they were made fast and other bits were made slow. And as a result, I think also as you're looking around, your eye stops in certain places and skids over other bits of the image. Um, but you feel like as a viewer, you also have actually, you have to do a kind of reversed process what you did, that you have to go through this different time layers yeah. to get to it. Huh? Yeah, I mean, maybe it's more engineered, the situation. Like, I, 
I think you can look at a Velasquez painting and you can see this. You can see the way that some bits are painted fast and some bits are painted slow, and, and there are different frequencies. Um, but I think I've had to almost deconstruct it and then engineer that situation from the ground up. You ever thought about being an archaeologist? <laughs> no. I could imagine, no? Hmm. <laughs> I think it's funny how you think of it as a science, or maybe, but actually it feels like there's a lot of invention in being an archaeologist as well. It always sounds highly dubious, a lot of the things they make up. <laughs> but okay. Very creative. I still want to go back. I mean, you, you told me about you came out, out of art school. There was this maybe brief or a bit longer uh, period that you didn't really paint. Um, I'm interested in that, not to, not to talk you into a painting crisis or so, but be, I'm, I'm interested in how this happens that you, that there is this, because I see it with, with a lot of painters that there is some moment in their career that maybe they have a crisis, they do not paint, and then it is followed by finding a new approach. Or, so I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, in, the, in the thoughts uh, that, that played a role in that not, not being able to paint, like something that you didn't want, and how that became the start of what you're doing now, actually. I think it was to do with this kind of... Um, I suppose in the wake of postmodernism, there was this kind of leveling, and everything felt like it had been reduced to aesthetic. And um, it felt very hard to find a way to make a painterly gesture. So when I, I mean, I actually stopped and I started working on film sets, and I was doing sometimes scenic painting in the background and there was this idea of the painting being completely mechanical you know sometimes someone would ask you to paint 3000 cherries on the uh, on the background of a stage um and i think when i started to make paintings again or i wouldn't even call them paintings but i involved the computer at that point so I started making these 3D models and 3D modeling software and, and wrapping them in geometric pattern and just making ink drawings initially that were trying to quite faithfully like transcribe these very, very simple images um, that in one way were figurative. They depicted forms, a very basic still life. But in another way, they were totally abstract as well because they just were made of geometric pattern. And there was this idea of almost like trying to stamp out any sort of handwriting or idiosyncrasy. But inevitably, I think, you can't help kind of um, al allowing some uh, sensibility to seep through some kind of human like sensibility always creeps in there so even by trying to do something totally mechanical you still end up making a gesture um and i think that was that was really the beginning of something that's a kind of logic that still governs the work in a way like a lot of the sculptures as well they have this very schematic process which is almost mechanical it's almost like trying to do the work of of the computer or replicate it, sorry, replicate it. But inevitably, they become these, as soon as you take them out of the computer and try and make them in, they become something else. It becomes this negotiation between the hand and the material and it, it, it fails. Uh, materials act in a different way to, to numbers in a computer or, or pixels or, um, but you're saying that there, is, that there is, even if you paint in a kind of mechanical, repetitious way, there will be some expression or content in there. That's what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that was kind of a way out, or to re-establish um, faith then in, the, in doing painting? Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. But does it mean that, that having found that, does it mean that you think as a painter you need, um, you need a kind of method or, or, or some limitations to work 
that you, that you set a few limitations to be able to make it work. Because somehow I, I, I ask myself, why is this, why are these screens and your search, why are they there? Do we need them to understand these paintings? I think, I think you need them to, to make your paintings. That is quite clear. Um, but it's, it's a thing I'm, I'm not, it's not clear for me. But. I think they um, open up a dialogue about images. And I think they also, yeah, they run parallel to the paintings. They, they create a sort of analogy about the way we look at images and the way that images can be translated from, you know, the computer has this back door and a front door and there's the image on the screen and then there's ones and noughts in the back. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a kind of beautiful form of abstraction. And the, and the other question about, do, do, you, do you feel like you have a kind of developed a method that, because you, you talk about a schema, I think. Um, what exactly do you mean that it's, it's a kind of a process that you figure out before you, before you set out to make a painting? Or? I think that you probably identified it a minute ago when you say that you create a set of parameters for yourself, maybe. And maybe it is that you create a structure for yourself so that you can uh, fuck it up. <laughs> um, and I think that's the case with the sculptures. And I think, yeah, it's the case with the paintings. And it doesn't mean that you, you go through the motions and do the same thing every time. But it means that you have to create this structure. You have to do certain things. And it changes from one group of paintings to the next often the sequence in which it happens or the way that I approach it. But yes, there is this idea of doing something very schematic in order to allow something intuitive to happen or to allow something serendipitous to happen. Or does it mean actually also this, 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 um, this thing with, uh, with, the, with the Google search? Does it mean you also want to, to make a point that as a painter you're just you're just jumping into something that is circulating anyhow, like a stream of, of images. Um. I think um, it's more like a sieve. I think it's more like you're turning your brain into a sieve and then you're flooding it. And then you find that actually you're still making decisions. You're still choosing things and identifying things. Um, and maybe that's more akin to what I was saying about the fortune teller. Someone will tell you 10 things and you'll say, they said so much that was true because two of the things were true to you at that moment. So when you look at 3,000 images, you find the ones that make sense. So artists are still a bit like fortune tellers? <laughs> I'm not, I'm not sure who the fortune teller is. <laughs> or, you're, or you're being robbed. Or... <laughs> Tell us about this. Uh, there's two sculptures or three. Um... Two sculptures. Two sculptures. Well, the sculptures. So I think they have a very similar kind of um, logic that underpins them to the paintings in a way. There's this idea of a very schematic process that takes place on the computer and this model that it's like this sort of perfect Euclidean model that's just geometry. And it's this idealized form that exists in the 3D modeling space. And then as soon as you start trying to make it physical, obviously it doesn't behave like that anymore. There is no perfect geometry in, in real world. And so I, I've made these models on the computer and they were based on an old Egyptian statue, a little onyx talisman of two fingers, and then translated this model into a sort of template and tried to make the objects out of very thin aluminium so that they can't support themselves. As soon as you make them physical, they get crumpled and dented and damaged, but they also kind of start to breathe, I think, as a result, as forms. And I made them as a pair, so one kind of 
is arrested in time and is filled with this resin so that it, it maintained its form. And the other one, I crumpled. So in the same way that the paintings get disrupted and there's this different speed of gesture, it might take a month or two to make a sculpture like that and then 10 seconds to crush it. But there's this idea of something that's been very, very schematically made, very, very meticulously made, and then you, you take your chances and crush it and see what happens. Do you actually see like like how I introduced you that that I felt like there's maybe two paintings in one or that, that there's kind of dualism within the paintings? Do, do, do you feel it yourself like that, or you see them as totally uh, harmonious or or on the same frequency? I think they can be both. You know, I think definitely there's always these different elements that are in tension, and in one way they're fighting with each other, but in another way they totally synthesize. And I think it's interesting, like t again to refer to this idea of figuration and abstraction. There's like a nice quote from Frank Stella where he says, describing a Rubens painting, if you squint in front of a Rubens painting, you get Jackson Pollock. Um, and I think it's possible for them to be uh, jarring and synthesized at the same time. I like the idea of it being several paintings in the same, at the same time, but that they're totally homogenous as well, somehow. And that they can fall apart and coalesce, you know, it's a kind of oscillation. If, if the quality of being unfinished is somehow very appealing to you, then how do you decide or know that a painting is finished? <laughs> like, is it, is it like, is it in the end an aesthetic judgment that you think, yeah, this is it, or is it no, I think it's this idea of it being on the brink of falling apart. It's like this thing, somehow you know when the painting is just, it somehow holds itself together, it coalesces into this image, this composition, but at the same time it feels like it might be about to disintegrate. The, the, um, when I met you before the show, I, 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 asked, I asked Toby if, if, if he had as a... Londoner who never left the city actually uh, well you left the city a lot for for exhibitions around the world but you always kept uh, stayed in London to live there um, but I don't think you feel like particularly connected to uh, uh, some British uh, type of um, painting or art making but then in the end you mentioned uh, Francis Bacon as some somebody that is very interesting to you um, could you say something about that? Like, because I, I think there's some painters that are very important for you who, who you would never take as an example for that, or like, yeah. like what you did with La, the Latour. Well, I think Francis Bacon's already doing the thing that I'm interested in, you know, like he already has these paintings that somehow um, function in lots of different ways. Uh, and you can read them in lots of different ways. And I really, I mean, we were talking about him and I love those paintings, and I've really looked at them so hard for 25 years or something, but longer. Um, but I really like the idea of him as an interior designer as well, that he made these sofas and chairs and carpets. And I really like the idea that somehow maybe he was still um, motivated by the same things as an interior designer, like he was still trying to somehow process all of his childhood traumas or you know whatever it is that f keeps forcing you to make things but that he was like yeah channeling his childhood traumas through the, the act of putting a sofa next to a carpet and choosing a particular set of colors for that carpet um and that that again is another form of abstraction so for you, um, Bacon was also an abstract painter, actually. Like, yeah. I noticed that you were, I think you were in a group show that was called uh, Recent Abstraction from Britain or something. Yeah. So you, you feel at home in, under such a title? Well, or? it's funny because that painting was actually of clouds. It was a, I mean, it was a very sort of abstracted image, but 
It was based on a cloud study by um, Constable. So in a way, it was figurative, and in a way, it was completely abstract before I'd even started. You know, and you look at clouds, and it's, you know, it's, they're ambiguous things. They're not exactly figurative, but you often find another level of figuration. People look at clouds, and they they see a dog, or they see, you know, a face, or whatever. There's already the it, the way people look at clouds is. Um, another example of, of projection. So maybe we should stop making this distinction that's <laughs> yeah. between figuration and abstraction, because there's both in it. That's what, you know. Yeah. Maybe this, well, somebody of you wants to, to join in with, uh, with the question that we try to escape, or... Um, or not. <laughs> Everything is perfectly crystal clear, as, as we discussed it. No, there is a question, yeah. <laughs> Can you talk about how you settle on an image or a subject and who the people are that you end up representing? Sure. I mean, it really, often I live with, uh, it takes a long time to find images that I really want to work with. And often it's quite a, I mean, I might <clears throat> live with a set of images. I've got files and files of different things that I'm sort of considering working with on my computer. Um, and I suppose they have to perform a number of different roles. Um, and sometimes, I mean, these, like I said, with these paintings here, it was these George de la Tour paintings, particularly because they were so narrative and because they were almost like filmic, because they had all these different kind of elements that told this story, but, and somehow taking that and then totally sort of disintegrating it so that that story is shattered, but maybe there's still some kind of trace of it, there's still kind of, or sometimes it might be a landscape, and then by eroding that kind of figurative image, um, it, it ceases to be a landscape, but perhaps it still has some of that logic. It still kind of moves the eye in a particular way, or it still has a kind of architecture that actually we understand because we've looked at so many things. And there is a kind of logic to the way that a landscape painting might move your eye so that you can feel like something's totally unfamiliar and yet very familiar. Um, or sometimes it might be to look at a painting that deals with the body and again it's sort of, there's a familiarity to it, to the composition. I really like the way that, you know, often you look at a painting and you can see that there's a whole genealogy of that painting. You know, you can look at a reclining nude by Matisse and it'll make you think of Velasquez reclining nude or it'll make you think of Manet. You know, you can see reincarnations. The same paintings, the same forms get reincarnated over and over again. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Is there another? So, so being in this digital time, working in different media, as you do, what, what is the thing that painting does that, that you can only do in painting? Um, I think, I don't know exactly why, but the paintings that I always go back to are often the ones that are somehow annoying. Uh, they kind of elude you somehow. Um, and paintings are sort of fugitive sometimes, or they, you know, they, they're slow. I think they're slow to make and they're slow to look at. They're slow, yeah. I think, Toby, if we stop here, we manage to, to leave the conversation somehow unfinished, which would be a pro appropriate. Um, thank you very much for talking about your work. Um, thank you all for coming and for your attention. And I think we can still maybe talk in smaller setting and uh, continue the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you.